Good evening. I will be reading two classic ghost stories. First one is an excerpt. Thank you for lovers of classic ghost stories. Excerpt from a classic ghost story by Michael Arlen called The Gentleman from America. Um, it's a story about a man who doesn't believe in ghosts. A man for a gentleman from America who goes to England and uh, there's a man who has a haunted country house, he's told. And uh, is wagered by these two Englishmen to spend a night in this haunted house. It turns out it, it's a, a hoax, but unfortunately the man goes mad and doesn't realize it's a hoax. Uh, one of the things that makes him go mad is that while he's there, he comes across this uh, book of ghost stories and uh, he reads it and it, uh, it bends his mind a little bit. And this is the ghost story. So this is a story within a story and it's uh, called The Phantom Footprints. The tale of the Phantom Footprints is still whispered with awe and loathing among the people that decayed but genteel, discreet district of London, known to those who live in it as Belgravia and to others as Pimlico. Julia and Geraldine Bigot Baggett were twin sisters who lived with their father, a widower, in a town in Lancashire called Wigan, or it may have been called Bolton. The tale finds Julia and Geraldine in their 19th year, and it also finds them in a very bad temper, for they were yearning for a more spacious life than can be found in Wigan, or it might be Bolton. This yearning their neighbors found all the more inexplicable since the parents of the girls were of Lancashire stock, their mother having been a bigot from Wigan and their father a bagot from Bolton. <laughs> you can imagine with what excess of gaiety Julia and Geraldine heard one day from their father that he had inherited a considerable property from a distant relation, and the reader can go on imagining the exaltation of the girls when they heard that the property included a mansion in Belgravia, since that for which they had always yearned most was to enjoy from a central situation the glittering life of Metropolis. The father preceded them from Wigan, or was it Bolton? He was a man of tidy disposition and wished to see that everything in, Belgrave, in the Belgravia house was ready against the, their, his daughter's arrival. When Julia and Geraldine did arrive, however, they were admitted by a genial old person of repellent aspect and disagreeable odor, who informed them that she was doing a bit of charring about the house, but would be gone by the evening. Their father, she added, had gone into the country to engage servants, but would be back the next day, and he had instructed her to tell Julia and Geraldine not to be nervous of sleeping alone in the strange house, that there was nothing to be afraid of, that he would, anyhow, be with them first thing in the morning. Now Julia and Geraldine, though twins, were of vastly different temperaments. For whereas Julia was a girl of gay and indomitable spirit who knew not fear, Geraldine suffered from agonies of timidity and knew nothing else. When, for instance, night fell and found them alone in the house, Julia could scarcely contain her delight at the adventure, while it was with difficulty that Geraldine could support the tremors that shook her girlish frame. Imagine then how differently they were affected when, as they lay in bed in their room towards the top of the house, they distinctly heard from far below a noise, as of someone moving. Julia sat up in bed intent, afraid, curious, unafraid, curious. Geraldine swooned. It's only a cat, Julia whispered. I'm going down to see. Don't, sighed Geraldine, for pity's sake. Don't leave me, Julia. Oh, don't be so childish, snapped Julia. Whenever there's a chance of the least bit of fun, you get shivers down your spine. But as you're so frightened, I will lock the door from the outside and take the key with me so that no one can get in when I am not looking. Oh, I hope it's a burglar. I'll give him the fright of his life, see if I don't. And the indomitable girl went, feeling her way to the door in the darkness. For to have switched on the light would have been to warn the injunction by suddenly appearing to him as an avenging phantom 
for having done not a little district visiting in Wigan or possibly Bolton, no one knew better than Julia of the depths of base superstition among the vulgar. A little calm by her sister's nonchalance, Julia lay still as a mouse in the darkness with her pretty head beneath the bedclothes. From without came a sound, and the very stillness of the house had impelled Julia to a new axis of terror, had she not concentrated on the works of Mr. Roger Kipling, which tell of the grit of the English people. Then, as though to test the grit of the English people in the most abominable way, came a dull noise from below. Julia restrained the scream, lay breathless in the darkness. The dull noise, however, was not repeated, and presently, Geraldine grew a little calmer, thinking that maybe her sister had dropped a slipper or something of the sort. But you can imagine into what terror the poor girl had been plunged had she been a student of the detective novels of the day, for then she must instantly have recognized a dull noise as a dull thud. And what can a dull thud mean but one thing? It was as she was praying a prayer to Our Lady that her ears grew aware of footsteps ascending the stairs. Her first feeling was of infinite relief. Of course, Julie had been right, and there had been nothing downstairs but a cat, or perhaps a dog. And now, Julia was returning, and in a second, they would have a good laugh together. Indeed, it was all Geraldine could do to restrain herself from jumping out of bed to meet her sister when she was assailed by a terrible doubt. And on the instant, her mind grew so charged with fear that she could no longer hold back her sobs. Suppose it was not Julia ascending. Suppose, oh God, sobbed Jul Geraldine transfixed with terror, yet hopeful of the best, the poor girl could not even command herself to reinsert her head beneath the sheets, and as always, the ascending steps came nearer. As they approached the door, she thought she would die of uncertainty, but as the key was fitted into the lock, she drew a deep breath of relief, to be at once shaken by the most acute agony of doubt, so that she had given anything in the world to be back Again, in Wigan, or even better, Bolton. Julia, she sobbed, Julia! For the door had opened. The footsteps were in the room, and Geraldine thought she recognized her sister's maidenly tread. But why did Julia not speak? Why this intolerable silence? Geraldine peered as hard as she might, could make out nothing in the darkness. The footsteps seemed to fumble in their direction but came always nearer to the bed, in which poor Geraldine lay more dead than alive. Oh, why did Julia not speak, just to reassure her? Julia, sobbed Geraldine, Julia! The footsteps seemed to fumble about the floor with an indecision maddening to Geraldine's distraught nerves, but at last they came beside the bed, and there they stood. In the awful silence, Geraldine could hear her heart beating like a hammer on a bell. Oh, the poor girl screamed. What is it, Julia? Why don't you speak? Never a sound nor a word gave back the livid silence. Never a sigh nor a breath, though Julia must be standing within a yard of the bed. She was only trying to frighten me, the beast, poor Geraldine thought. And unable for another second to bear the cruel silence, she timidly stretched out a hand to touch her sister when... To her infinite relief, her fingers touched the white rabbit fur with which Julia's dressing gown was delicately trimmed. You beast, Julia! She sobbed and laughed. Never a word, however, came from the still shape. Geraldine, impatient of the continuation of a joke which seemed to her in the worst taste, raised her hand from the fur that she might touch her sister's face. But her fingers had risen no farther than Julia's throat when they touched something wet and warm, and with a scream of indescribable terror, Geraldine fainted away. When Mr. Bigot Baggett admitted himself into the house early the next morning, his eyes were assailed by a dreadful sight. At the foot of the stairs was a pool of blood, with which in a loathsome trail drops wound up 
the stairway. Mr. Bigot Baggett, fearful lest something out of the way had happened to his beloved daughters, rushed frantically up the stairs. The trail of blood led to his daughter's room, and there, in the doorway, the poor gentleman stood appalled. So foul was the sight that met his eyes. His beloved Geraldine lay in the bed, her hair snow white, her lips raving with the shrill fancies of a maniac, while on the floor beside the bed lay stretched in a pool of blood his beloved Julia, her head half severed from her trunk. The tragic story unfolded only when the police arrived. It, it's then, it then became clear that Julia her head half severed from her body, and therefore a corpse had yet, with indomitable purpose, come up the stairs to warn her timid sister against the homicidal lunatic who had just escaped from an asylum nearby and had penetrated into the house. However, the police consoled, consoled the distracted father, not a little, by pointing out that the escape of the homicidal lunatic from the asylum had done some good, in so much as there would now be room in an asylum near her home for Geraldine. <laughs> By Michael Arlen, the full story is called The Gentleman from America. And uh, without further ado, oh, uh, we have another guest. Thank you for coming to uh, Ghost Stories Live. Uh, our next classic story is called present at a hanging, and it is uh, from Ambrose Bierce, who had a rather uh, crazy life. Uh, he was a very prolific writer, uh, American writer, uh, wrote hundreds of stories, uh, but then went off to uh, Mexico to fight with uh, Pancho Villa, and was never heard of again. So he's, his end is unknown. Uh, this s story is called present at a hanging. I'll put my glasses on. Um, an old man named Daniel Baker, living near Lebanon, Iowa, was suspected by his neighbors of having murdered a peddler who had obtained permission to pass the night at his house. This was in 1853, when peddling was more common in the western country than it is now and was attended with considerable danger. The peddler, with his pack, traversed the country by all manner of lonely roads and was compelled to rely upon the country people for hospitality. This brought him into relation with queer characters, some of whom were not altogether scrupulous in their methods of making a living, murder being an acceptable means to that end. It occasionally occurred that a peddler with a diminished pack and a swollen purse would be traced to the lonely dwelling of some rough character and never could be traced beyond. This was so in the case of Old Man Baker, as he was always called. Such names are given to the western settler, settlements only to elderly persons who are not esteemed. To the general disrepute of social unworthy, unworth is affixed the special reproach of age. A peddler came to this house and none went away, and that is all that anybody knew. Seven years later, the Reverend Mr. Cummings, a Baptist minister well known in that part of the country, was driving by Baker's farm one night. It was not very dark. There was a bit of moon somewhere above the light veil of mist that lay along the earth. Mr. Cummings, who was at all times a cheerful person, was whistling a tune which he would occasionally interrupt to speak a word of friendly encouragement to his horse. As he came to a little bridge across a dry ravine, he saw the figure of a man standing upon it, clearly outlined against the gray background of a misty forest. The man had something strapped on his back and carried a heavy stick, obviously an itinerant peddler. His attitude had in it a suggestion of abstraction, like that of a sleepwalker. Mr. Cummings reined in his horse when he arrived in front of him, gave him a pleasant salutation and invited him to a seat in the vehicle. If you are going my way, he added. The man raised his head, looked him full in the face, but neither answered nor made any further movement. The minister, with good-natured persistence, repeated his invitation. 
At this the man threw his right hand forward with, from his side and pointed downward as he stood on the extreme edge of the bridge. Mr. Cummings looked past him over into the ravine, saw nothing unusual and withdrew his eyes to address the man again. He had disappeared. The horse, which all this time had been uncommonly restless, gave at the same moment a snort of terror and started to run away. Before he regained control of the animal, the minister was at the crest of the hill a hundred yards along. He looked back and saw the figure again, at the same place and in the same attitude as when he had first observed it. Then, for the first time, he was conscious of a sense of the supernatural and drove home as laugh rapidly as his willing horse would go. On arriving at home, he related his adventure to his family, and early the next morning, accompanied by two neighbors, John White Corwell and Abner Riser, returned to the spot. They found the body of old man Baker hanging by the neck from one of the beams of the bridge, immediately beneath the spot where the apparition had stood. A thick coating of dust slightly dampened by the mist covered the floor of the bridge, but the only footprints were those of Mr. Cummings' horse. And taking down the body, the men disturbed the loose, friable earth of the slope below it, disclosing human bones already nearly uncovered by the action of water and frost. They were identified as those of the lost peddler, at the double inquest, the coroner's jury found that Daniel Baker died by his own hand while suffering from temporary insanity, while Samuel, Samuel Moritz was murdered by some person or persons to the jury unknown. Thank you. Now let me tidy up. No, no, let's not tidy up the stage. Let's just move along.